Good morning. Uh, my, my name is Dennis Shedd, and I'm representing Pedro Valentin. Valentin's brother, Simon, shot Timothy Bond, and Valentin was convicted of first-degree murder at a trial at which his right to counsel was violated in two respects. Counsel failed to impeach key evidence offered by the Commonwealth to show that he was a joint venturer, and he was absent at a critical stage of the proceedings. Um, the Commonwealth presented evidence that after Simon shot Bond, uh, Valentin stomped on his head, said die, and then swore at him. That statement gave the Commonwealth direct evidence of the intent required for premeditated murder. It didn't have to rely as it normally does on circumstantial evidence to show intent. And while counsel effectively impeached the testimony that he'd stomped on Bond, she made no effort to impeach the testimony about the statement, although she easily could have. Only one witness had testified that Valentin had made that statement, although when that witness spoke to the police on the night of the shooting, he said that Valentin had not said anything. So this isn't evidence that simply raises doubts about the witness's credibility in general. This impeaches direct evidence of the intent elements of the crime, but, a powerful but there already form of impeachment was, that warrants a new trial. There already was evidence that was impeached going to the exact same point. I, I mean, I guess there's sort of two issues. One, one is, yes, it, it's strong evidence uh, suggestive of intent, but so is stomping on the head of somebody who's been shot twice. I agree. I agree. Uh, and, and that she did impeach. That's that, right. That's number one. Number two, um, given that there was, when this was tried and there was no question that your client was the joint venturer, not the principal, um, uh, the, the definition of sharing intent is fairly broad. So, you know, so, so I guess I'm just <clears throat> wondering, particularly where um, the attorney has, states a reason, it may not be a terribly persuasive reason, but can we say it was manifestly unreasonable to do that and look at whether that, A, was it manifestly unreasonable? And do we look at that in the circumstances where there was other evidence going to this same point that she did impeach? Well, first, I would, as to the first, I would say her reasons, the reasons she offered for not impeaching the witnesses' testimony were manifestly unreasonable. And she offered two reasons for that. The first was that she had impeached the witness on two other points. But that does nothing to impeach the testimony about the statement. And in fact, the fact that she impeaches the witness about two other matters, but not the statement, could have left the jurors with, a, with the impression that, in fact, the witness had reported, reported the statement to the police. Secondly, she said that she didn't want to highlight this statement. Well, this statement, direct evidence of intent to kill in premeditation, was going to be highlighted. The prosecutor mentioned it in opening. He brought it out in direct. He highlighted it in, in his closing. And in fact, counsel mentioned it in her own closing, suggesting that Valentin had not made this statement, although she offered no evidentiary support for that position. Now, um, the Commonwealth takes the position that, well, impeaching the statement would have been inconsistent with the alibi defense. But that ignores the arguments counsel, in fact, made in closing. The alibi defense was not particularly strong, and she only mentioned it briefly at the end of her argument. Before that, she had argued that Valentin hadn't stomped on Bond, citing the impeachment evidence she had presented on that point. And she also suggested, as I said, that he hadn't made that statement. But again, there was no evidentiary support for that. So did you, do you think she would have argued that, um, I'm just curious, she, she argued that there was no, that no one stomped on his head, right? Right. So what would she have argued? That maybe somebody stomped on his head, but they didn't say die? I mean, I'm just. No, she would have argued, look, that there's no evidence that, that this person, person was no stomped on the head. Stomped there's no evidence of that head. at all. And there's no statement suggest, suggesting that he ha had any intent to kill. All that's left, if you take away, if you take away. the die was, the die mother effer was right. on the, with the stomping on the head. Right, and, and, and as, as the evidence. Argued there was in evidence insufficient that there was any stomping at all. Right, 
Well, th th this is two separate things. Okay. One thing is he says he stomped on his head and she impeaches that. Yeah. And then she also says that, 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 that he makes a statement, die motherfucker, is what she says. So, but if you take away, if you leave the stomp, if you take away the stomp and leave the statement, that is still evidence of intent to kill and premeditation. Doesn't she argue that he didn't make the statement? In she did closing? argue it, but again, there was no evidence, evidence to support that argument. She hadn't done anything to, to support that argument. So, so except, except I assume brought out in the other witnesses that know that he didn't say anything, right? No, she did not. That the, there, there was were, no were there other witnesses to this stomping or to this murder. Yes, there were num there were there were there were other, other witnesses. She didn't ask them anything about the, any, any statements there. She had uh, uh, one witness. There were four witnesses that said he'd stomped on him. Only only three of them had reported that to the police at the time. One of the one witness at the time had said that she, that she hadn't even seen a second person there. And all these, uh, these other witnesses bring out these extra statements sh very shortly before the trial when the person who had done the shooting was missing. You know, so it was going to be Pedro Valentin tried or nobody at that point. So very shortly before the trial, three yeah, other but, witnesses but the, come the, forward and report this. Was the jury told that Simon was missing? No. <clears throat> they weren't told he was missing, no, but he certainly wasn't there. They I weren't told that. I understand that, no. but I don't think we can make a decision based on a supposition that the jury were out to get Pedro because... Simone was missing. Well, it was brought out at the trial. These other witnesses added inculpatory details very shortly before trial. And in, in closing, Including counsel, Stokes, argue, right? counsel argued that, you know, at this point, this man is, is, is the only game in town. That's what, that's what she says in closing argument. So, but again, she, there was no impeachment of the statement itself in this case. And if she had impeached, so the issues before the jury are, one, did he participate? And two, did he share the intent? So counsel impeached the evidence that he participated by stomping on Bomb. He didn't impeach the statement, giving the jury no reason to question. He participated in other ways as well. He came to them. He was standing next to his brother behind the victim. I mean, it wasn't just stomping on his head that was the participation, right? I mean, they, well, they, 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 were, they were a team. One person shot, but... At least the Commonwealth would argue they were a team, that he was a lookout, he was, he was, he was there to, you know, do a lot of things. Yes, I would agree the Commonwealth would certainly argue they were a team, and I'm certainly not arguing the evidence would be insufficient had she impeached this testimony. But if she had impeached the testimony of the statement as well as, as, as the stomp, the Commonwealth's evidence of malice as opposed to mere association would have been much weaker, and I believe there would be very little credible evidence of premeditation at all. The other evidence does show that they approached Bond, Simon shot him and ran, and then Pedro Valentin runs after him and says, put the gun away. And I think that's much weaker evidence of pre much weaker evidence that he knew what his brother intended when he approached and, and that he shared his brother's, brother's uh, intent at that time. Now, the second way... Let me ask you another question, sure. I'm sorry. But um, this argument... I, I appreciate the fact that the gatekeeper uh, opened the gate, and here you are. I, I get that. But is it appropriate for the full court to consider whether there was waiver of this point in that it wasn't argued on direct appeal? Or I can't remember whether there was another motion for new trial. Uh, there was no other motion for a new trial. At that I don't believe there was any motion for a new trial at that time. Um, and as far as a uh, waiver issue, I, I mean, the issue here is ineffective assistance of counsel, and ultimately, I mean, it's a post-direct appeal, so ultimately, I think yes, the issue but, doesn't but make mi any difference. But Ms. Robinson I mean, didn't do the direct appeal, correct? Right, right. But um, ultimately, at this stage, whether you look at it as ineffective assistance of counsel or under the waiver standard, a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice, I think it's a really, it really doesn't make a lot of difference as far as the, the ultimate analysis goes. No, I, I, I wasn't. I was really talking about waiver in the sense of... It wasn't raised on the direct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just asking what you think about it. Yeah, I just think, I mean, I just think really, you know, I'm, I, I think there's nothing inappropriate about raising an ineffective assistance of counsel claim at this stage. There was no prior motion for, motion for a new trial. And as I say, ultimately, I don't think the standard review make, makes much difference in the, an, in, in the analysis. You know, it'd be substantial risk under waiver. Um, uh, Valentin's right to counsel was also violated when counsel was absent during a critical stage of the trial and her partner, the jury deliberations, and her partner who'd done no work on the case sat in 
when the judge answered two jury questions. Was and and certainly the... Um, can we just, I just I was curious in, with your argument, was there anything wrong with the supplementary instructions the judge gave to those juror questions? Uh, I, I believe an attorney who is familiar with a case could have asked the judge for additional instructions. And in particular, in this case, it would have been appropriate to ask, and of course, the joint venture instruction for an instruction that mere association <coughs> isn't enough for joint venture, nor is making an effort to conceal the crime after the fact. In this case, that would be the fact that he ran after his brother and said, said uh, put, put the gun away. So those could have been added to the instruction, Did, but they were they, were they, I can't remember this, were they part of the original instructions? No, they were not. They were so, not. So presumably, since Ms. Robinson was there the first time, um, it was not likely. I mean, uh, if she had been there, it, if she had if she had not gone to Connecticut but had been there mm -hmm. and not her partner, um, since the instructions, in, in, as I read them, were materially the same both times, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the claim would be as to uh, if one takes the position that this is different from having no counsel. I mean, it just is. Um, different from having no counsel. So you have to, I think, look at does it make it, you know, what, what's different? And it seems to me that the substance of the instructions were basically the same both times. So I'm not sure what one could say as to how there, there was prejudice other than a, a theoretical one, which is a, it's a fair point, but. Well, First, my position is prejudice isn't required in this case. Representation by unprepared counsel is a structural error. But as far as whether uh, Ms. Robinson could have made a difference if she was there, I will, would note um, her request for instruction did include the association uh, request. It did not include <coughs> any request about uh, the fact that um, subsequent efforts to conceal aren't enough. But on the other hand, when you know, when you know a jury is focusing on this particular issue, you may think of instructions that might be appropriate that you hadn't included in the original request or may not have objected to originally. So the mere fact that she's now notified this is an issue this jury is focusing on could lead her to ask the judge to instruct on inferences that, that she had not requested the first time around. Do we know that substitute counsel was in fact a partner for trial counsel and, and, uh, or does it matter? Uh, we do know he was a partner that's in their affidavits that each of them filed. I don't think it makes any difference in this case, really, because, again, he had done no work on the case. He hadn't attended the trial. He didn't consult with counsel about the uh, well, um, well, they had talked about the, the judge case. had made. They had talked about the case. He wasn't coming in there with zero knowledge of the case. Right. I mean, there's, no in, it, there's nothing to suggest that his knowledge of the case was anything more than Partners are in a firm talking generally in, you know, at, at lunchtime about what cases they're working on. It's not any detail. It's clearly he doesn't have detailed knowledge of this case. He's not like he's read the, read, uh, read the police reports and the transcripts of the grand jury and all that. He admits he had, they both write that he had done no work on this case. St he Mr. hadn't Shea, attended the trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. Getting back to your effort to uh, treat this as structural error, uh, the cases that you cite all involve uh, circumstances where there was no one present uh, representing the defendant. That's not what we have here. Right. So how do you make this a case of structural error such that you can bypass the prejudice analysis if your case is so different from all of these other cases? I would, there is, um, let me just check my notes here for a second. The chronic the, the is, is, I think, the person was there, I believe. Yeah, there was. Um, I guess the reason I get the structural errors, it, some of the language here, I'm chronic. In this third, I'm arguing this falls essentially under the third prong of chronic, which is that there are some situations where the likelihood that an attorney could give effective assistance is so small that a presumption is appropriate. And in the earlier prongs of chronic, they don't require simply a, a lack of representation throughout trial. They look at whether there's a lack of effective, represent, a, a lack of effective representation at a critical stage. And in this case, 
the reason I say a presumption of prejudice is, is, is appropriate is that the jury is asking for help with an issue uh, on which they're focusing. And to determine, to form a position as to what response a judge should give to the question requires a knowledge of the issues raised by the facts of the case. An attorney who hasn't been involved with the case, who doesn't know all the facts and the issues involved, is in no position to do that. And in fact, it's not apparent here that counsel's partner uh, thought that it was his role to think independently of what objections or requests he should be making. At the end, he simply says, I wasn't here for the initial charge, but I want to preserve any objections counsel made. And here, um, I see my time is up. Just one brief point. You know, we don't know what the jury thought when they came down, saw Ms. Robinson was gone, somebody they'd never seen before is sitting in for her. There's no, no explanation for offered. It could have appeared to them as though, you know, she thought the case was hopeless and just le left her client, abandoned him. But uh, ultimately, I think my position is that this is a critical stage, and you, and you need some knowledge of the case, more than her partner had at this point, to effectively decide what the judge sh sh should do in this kind of circumstance. And I've, so my time is up, so I will rest on the remainder of my brief, as far, but particularly as regards the Article 12 argument. Thank you, Counsel. <clears throat> Good morning, Iris. May it please the court, Paul Lynn for the Commonwealth. Mr. Lynn, before you start, let me, let me start at the end. Don't, don't you think that it would have been more appropriate, if not required, for the judge to ask the defendant whether he agreed to the substitution of counsel? Well, I would first point out that that, that was never raised below. That was a, a completely new issue. Uh, where I think in the circumstances where it's a, a a partner of counsel, uh, the, you know, the the judge at this point has uh, no sense that, that this uh, partner is not up to speed on the case. There's really, this is not a situation in which he's, like uh, uh, the cases I cite in my brief where, you know, he has co-defendants counsel fill in or something like that. Well, maybe this is a waived issue. Surely the defendant would have known he didn't consent to it at the time, mm -hmm. but don't you think when new counsel is substituted during a critical part of the proceeding, the judge should make some inquiry of the defendant as to whether he is okay with this, agrees with this, consents to this? It might be the better policy. Uh, it's, uh, the, I, I don't think it's constitutionally required. Uh, there's certainly no authority that, that, that seems to suggest that. Because uh, again, it is not a, it's not a waiver of counsel, it's not a waiver of, of conflict-free counsel, it's simply a, a substitution of counsel. Uh, especially here, where it's a member of the same firm, uh, it's it's uh, common in my experience for uh, people to have you know counsel standing by, even sometimes too with the judge's agreement to be able to cross. But one witnesses. would hope one would hope that his counsel explained to him that she would not be available and that she was bringing a partner in who would be there in case. She states that in her affidavit that she talked to the defendant about this. Yeah, she she doesn't say he agreed, but she says no, that she they did they talk about it. it. Yes, that that's exactly what she says. And I would point out that neither of the attorneys say in their affidavits that this was just lunchtime conversation. Okay. Uh, they <clears throat> say, you know, we I the the substitute counsel uh, did not work on the case, but we did discuss the case. And neither of them suggest in their affidavits that this was just some kind of casual mention of the case. Did, did the judge, um, I th Mr. Shedd, I, I think I heard him, but I just want to confirm. The judge said nothing to the jury about why she wasn't there? I don't believe so. I'd have to check, but I don't remember uh, him saying anything about that. There was just a discussion at sidebar, mm -hmm. or even with the jury absent. I would have to check that, but I, believe, I don't believe there was anything said. Uh, but as this court has pointed out, uh, the, the instructions that were given were correct. This is not a situation, certainly not a situation like Powell, where but, well, they weren't the, correct, but they weren't. I mean, but you wouldn't have known it in 1993. Correct. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. There was obviously the the third prong problem, but and the uh, joint venture. But yeah, they were they were correct as far as anything the defense counsel could have done at the time, and any additional um, arguments that would have been made. These these were adequate instructions. It didn't deprive the defendant of a substantial ground of defense. Uh, and, so this is just not a situation where you have to have exhaustive knowledge as if you were trying an entire case. What would case. happen if the instructions were incorrect? Hmm? What would have happened if the answers to the jury questions were incorrect? Or just, you know, erroneous in some material respect? 
Well, and uh, substitute counsel. Well, then you'd have a claim of ineffectiveness. Then you'd have then you'd have prejudice. But then you're saying prejudice. And exactly. Prejudice, prejudice has to be the right standard. Right. That's the it's the it's the ineffectiveness standard. All cases regarding whether or not counsel was prepared are governed under the ineffectiveness system, so, so and that's you're true just whether or not. saying it's not structural. It's not structural. If if counsel claim that counsel never spoke to the defendant before trial, ineffectiveness. Claim that. Uh, Council had only 10 days to prepare for, for trial, ineffectiveness. And here the defendant, who has the burden of showing ineffectiveness at this point, has not shown that there was any uh, substantial ground of defense that was deprived. Uh, unless there are further questions, I'll turn back to the, the issue of impeachment. Uh, as I know this court knows, uh, impeachment is almost never grounds for ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, here what counsel did was she, she towed a very fine line. She raised her entire defense was alibi. Now, that's not all she argued in her closing argument, but that's all the evidence that she put on. Let me ask you that. I, I <coughs> meant to ask Mr. Shedd, and I didn't. Um, there was some exchange between her and the judge after the instructions in which she said, I didn't want you to give, I think she said, I didn't want you to give an alibi instruction or something to that effect. Right, I think, I think the, the, the alibi instruction that's usually given is the one that there's nothing, there's nothing sinister about alibi, it just means you're not, yeah, you, it just means you weren't at the scene, there's evidence that you weren't at the scene. Oh, it, well, I, I mean, it, she wasn't saying to the judge, that isn't my defense anymore. No, no, that's oh, not okay. at all what she was saying, okay. at least that's not how I read it. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, that's my understanding of what the alibi instruction is, it's not, obviously, if the it should be obvious to the jury that if the, they, they're not convinced the defendant is there, they can't convict him beyond a reasonable doubt. But, but what do you say to the argument that um, the reasons given by the attorney uh, for not uh, cross-examining uh, cross Mr. Stokes, I think that was his name. Right? Yes, correct. Um, uh, on this point, whereas she did on the other, um, it, it, it doesn't follow uh, when she said, I, I didn't want to highlight it, and yet she does highlight it in her closing. I mean, it just, it, there, there, is a, there is a certain lack of rationality to it. Yes, and this brings me back to my point, is that she really had to toe a fine line, and I would disagree <laughs> that she highlighted it. She makes a, a very offhand comment about it. She's saying, look, all these witnesses, they're making up facts as they go along, there's, we've, I've shown you there's no evidence of the stomp. You know, now there's nobody else to prosecute but Pedro Valentin. Now he's the only game in town. So now they're saying it was a stomp. Now they're saying die MF. Uh, and that's all she says about it. So it's not really a matter of highlighting it. And she has to, she has to finesse this because if the jury gets the impression that she's hedging her bets, that's going to look bad in the jury's eyes. So she does this all under the rubric of impeaching the witness's credibility, which was a, an excellent strategy. But she has to be very careful not to go overboard on that, because if she does, the jury's going to say, wait a minute, she's a, she's, now she, that's not consistent with her alibi defense. Now she's talking about what this guy, who isn't even supposed to be the defendant, did. Um, uh, would an, an, another attorney have cross-examined on this statement? Perhaps, but the question is, was it manifestly unreasonable without the benefit of hindsight for counsel not to do this? Stokes was the only one who said that he had said this. Correct. None of the other witnesses, and yeah, I mean, that's not, I, I'm not sure counsel, I don't believe counsel actually affirmatively pointed that out, but none of the other witnesses heard him make any statement, heard the defend, made the other man that who's, uh, was identified as the defendant. And there's no the question statement. that there was uh, information in the prior interview that Stokes had given that Stokes had said that no statements were made. Correct. So what, was the re what, what reason would there be for not asking Stokes about that? Why wouldn't you want to impeach his credibility on that? Point? Well, he's, he's, he's his credibility was impeached at length. Uh, it, the, the reason is because if you concentrate too much on but it was impeached at length anyway. Right. So how was it focusing too much to do one more obvious question? It's, that's, that was a question of strategy. How, how far can I go before the jury says, wait a minute? And the, that's what defense counsel says in her affidavit is this is the point. I didn't think I wanted to go one step further. I thought 
you know, I'd done, I'd done my job. I'd, showed, I'd shown he was a liar. I think that's a point, too. It's, it's, the <coughs> counsel argues that, well, if, they, if, if, he point, if counsel pointed out that he hadn't made certain statements or he'd changed certain statements, but that he did, uh, counsel didn't point out that Stokes hadn't made this statement, that means they believe, oh, he must have made that. But my position is, counsel pointed out that Stokes was lying, that Stokes was making stuff up. And it wasn't likely that the jury was going to say, oh, this guy's making stuff up. So therefore, I'm going to believe something else that he said. When she impeached him uh, extensively on t as to other matters, did she do so on the basis of self-contradiction, like the um like would have been the case with this yes, prior interview? Yes, yes. Things, things he, he hadn't, hadn't said, said it before. Yes, I believe so. I'd have to double check, but I'm almost certain she, she pointed out things that, that were inconsistent with his, with his statement to the police. The thing about the, the, the difference, and maybe this is your point, I mean, the, the other witnesses whom I think she also uh, crossed on the issue, uh, had also come late to the statement about the stomping, correct? I mean, there were other witnesses who testified to the stomping. Right. I, one had, of the witnesses, I can't remember which one now, said you know, she hadn't seen anybody else with, the, with Simone Valentin. So, uh, yeah, there were certainly significant changes between the statement at, statements at the scene and the statements immediately after the crime and the, and the testimony. And she, she the, the attorney, cross-examined the other witnesses on their late-breaking statements about the stomping, Exactly right, right yes. Uh, I would also point out that the statement really has nothing to do with premeditation. The evidence of premeditation is that he, he comes out with his brother, and they go across, and he's there at the time of the shooting. Really, the statement is the epitome of spontaneity. It's, it's something you would say even if you, you didn't even, if you're, if you, um, you know, yeah, except that it, it does go to intent to kill. Oh, no question. I'm not going to deny that. It certainly Given goes to intent to kill. you need that as a starter. Right, yes. Uh, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go, I mean, intent to kill can be, can be inferred strongly from the fact that he's with his brother as they, as they walk up behind the victim. He's standing right next to him when he puts a gun to his head and shoots him twice, and then he runs after him and says, put away the gun. Um, you know, granted, it's stronger. There's no question that it's stronger with this die statement. Uh, but the, the, the ultimate question is, was it manifestly unreasonable for defense counsel to conduct the cross-examination as she did? And I think you can't do that here without second-guessing and looking at hindsight and uh, counsel, not following the severity counsel, standard. What, what was the strength of the Commonwealth's case other than these shaky witnesses who were kind of making up things right before the trial. Was there anything else that the Commonwealth offered to prove the defendant's guilt other than what these individuals said they saw and heard? No, there was no, no physical evidence or anything of that sort. I, the, the witnesses changed stories uh, on certain details, like, the, like the, uh, the stomping. And as I mentioned, one witness said there was only one person. But you know, the, 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 the Three of the witnesses were very clear that the, the defendant did come to the scene and was with his brother at the scene and ran off with his brother. That, wasn't, that really wasn't the big issue. There was the stomping and things like that that was the issue. And of course, with the one witness, uh, the fact that she hadn't seen anybody else. If there are no further questions, the Commonwealth will otherwise rest on its brief. Thank you, counsel. Thank you.